I'm Andy Johnson. Um, I teach New Testament at Nazarene Theological Seminary in Kansas City, and I wrote a book for Cascade called Holiness and the Missio Dei. Um, one of the, the first things that uh, I note in the book is um, the issue that the Bible doesn't, uh, doesn't begin with Genesis 3 and it doesn't end with Revelation 20. In other words, it doesn't end with the story about God being only concerned about individual uh, making making right what happened when um, when the first human pair messed up. In other words, God is not only concerned about their guilt. God has a bigger mission in mind, and that mission at the beginning uh, starts at the beginning of Genesis and ends at, at the end of Revelation 22 in, in a canonical reading. It's uh, that God's mission is to bring all of creation to its uh, to its intended destiny or its full potential of bursting with profuse, abundant life in the spirit-saturated new creation, and God. Uh, God makes God uh, wants human beings to be involved in that, and so uh, God gives human beings a mission at the beginning of uh, Genesis, and never releases us from that mission, and that is to participate in His bringing creation to its intended destiny, its full potential. Well, uh, in the very at the very beginning, uh, the way we see God acting in the garden is uh, part and parcel of what it means for God to be holy because what God initially does is, is to start by blessing creation, that is uh, making creation such that it can uh, abound with fruitful life and blessing. And so the very first time we hear the word holiness or sanctification in Scripture is when God blesses the seventh, the, the, the seventh day and makes it holy. That is, he, he makes it a time where it will provide life-giving rest for all of God's creatures and all of God's uh, creation so that creation can have true shalom. Uh, and so God's character and activity at the very beginning is characterized by, uh, by the, the desire to give blessing and life to his creation. Of course, we all know the story of what happens in the garden and humans uh, simply uh, refuse to reflect the image of God to creation and to each other. And God has to take a different track, and so God elects Abraham and his family, and uh, God uh, wants to teach them the the way of the Lord, which is the way of doing justice and uh, uh, righteousness. And that way of doing justice and righteousness shows us what his his own character looks like, and uh, he wants Abraham to teach his family his way. And um, when Abraham and his family go down to Egypt. Uh, we, we, again, we know what happens in, in Egypt. They become enslaved. God delivers them, hears their cry, delivers them, and then when he delivers them, he gives them a kind of a job manual, Torah. It is a, a job manual that uh, says, if, if in fact you are going to be my, you already are, but if you're going to carry out your vocation as my uh, holy priestly nation, then uh, Here's, here's the job manual, and if, if you participate in the kinds of practices this job manual um, lays out, then uh, you will be reflecting my very character to each other and to the nations. Israel, of course, like the church over and over again, um, has proven that we don't do a very good job at reflecting God's image and God's character, God's holiness to those around us. And so something had to change. And something did in Jesus when God's own holiness, God's own character, uh, was embodied in a crucified Jew, in a, a Jew, a, a Jew from Nazareth, who became the the truly human image of the the unseen God, and um, and this is where God's holiness was located, uh, that we see reflected throughout Scripture, and as uh, as those who are uh, bodies of that crucified and risen Christ as those who belong to, in Michael Gorman's words, colonies of cruciformity in our world as we are participating in the pattern of uh, God's activity to bring creation to its intended destiny. As we are doing that, of course, we only do that as we are enabled by the Spirit. And as we are doing that, God is in the process of sanctifying or making us whole, even in even in and by means of those very activities, and and God uh, God uh, throughout 
uh, the at least the second part of the book. In the second part of the book, uh, I deal with uh, I deal with Paul, I deal with Acts, and I deal with Revelation, and I see show various uh, show some some nuances of what it means to uh, participate in God's mission uh, in the in the Gospels, in Acts, in uh, and also in Revelation, and what it means to be holy. One one of the things that um, that has become very clear uh, to me as I've been thinking about this issue, and I've thought about this issue actually for quite a while, just a little bit of personal disclosure. I grew up in a tradition who calls itself a holiness tradition. And um, one of the, the things that, uh, one of, the, one of the, the, the very, probably one of the biggest impetuses for me to write this uh, book was to try to think through my own tradition. And that kind of thinking about holiness itself being mostly about uh, individual piety, uh, attempts to uh, attempts to to not not uh, not to do something that might take away from your holiness was the the was the kind of holiness tradition that I grew up with. In its better moments, it wasn't that, but that that was what it tended to be. Um, what becomes very clear is that we are only holy as, as in fact, uh, the only holiness we have obviously is uh, derived directly from God. And we are only holy, at least if we are Christian, we are only holy as we belong to a real live body of the crucified and risen Christ. Because corporately we are holy before, before we can ever speak about being personally holy. We have to belong to a corporate body in which the, the Spirit of God is at work in and among us uh, before we can ever start talking about a holiness as a kind of personal possession. And one of the things that I wanted to emphasize with the book is that holiness isn't primarily about keeping away from things. We see that with, in the book. You can see it with Jesus, who, who's the, the uh, quintessential boundary crosser. As Jesus brings God's holiness, that is, God's life-giving activity, uh, and, and brings it to bear by means of the Spirit on all kinds of bodies around him. Uh, bodies that are are excluded from um, that are excluded from sometimes temple uh, worship, bodies that are uh, that are marred and scarred, and bodies that are controlled by uh, the demonic. He brings God's holiness, God's life giving, beneficial presence to bear on their bodies. And when we become the only way we can ever imagine uh, that we are holy or becoming holy or God is making us holy is that we would be in, involved in a corporate community, which doesn't mean necessarily uh, that there is nothing called personal holiness. There is. But, but being involved in a community in which the spirit we are involved in working to bring uh, God's own uh, life-giving presence. Um, and benefit to those around us, on bodies around us. Um, so uh, holiness is so much more than about individual uh, guilt or an individual uh, pious possession, uh, something you can just easily uh, lose. It's about, it is about reflecting the very activity, pattern and activity of God in God's bringing creation to its in intended destiny. Uh, so. Uh, holiness is about a, a whole pattern of life uh, that can't just be understood as um, avoiding certain practices. Although, if uh, God does continue to call us to avoid certain practices that are what I think I call in the book shalom robbing kinds of practices for communities. I start the book with a story about a, a church in Bangladesh. Um, a church uh, in a society, it's a caste society, you know, and the, the, the people in this particular church were members of a very low caste, uh, uh, members of a low caste uh, uh, community in, in Bangladesh. And they, they already were experiencing all sorts of uh, oppression, even on a, on a daily basis, even before they became Christian. But when they became Christian, 
um, the things got worse for them in their village. Uh, there were people who wouldn't allow them to drink from the uh, the village well, wouldn't allow them to draw their water from the village well. It was the only well within, I think it was about three miles or so that had clean water, safe water to drink. And when you're, when you're living at a subsistence level and you have to then mo- go – I go three miles away and carry your water in every day. It was utterly exhausting for them. So they thought they'd try a well that was closer, um, probably about a mile and a half away rather than three miles away. Uh, It turns out the water was not safe to drink, and many of the adults in their congregation uh, got sick, and some of their children actually died. Um, But the through, through a network of churches and through one individual who had a little parcel of land in the church. He donated the land. The network of churches helped them build a tube well, which gave them the best drinking water anywhere around. And rather than excluding anybody in the village from drinking uh, from their well, they invited all to come, including those who had excluded them and you could even say who were at least indirectly responsible for their death of their children. They, they, they invited them in, told them to come in, and, um, and when they, they, they came in as a result of that action, um, as a result of that action, there have been some of the very people who were persecuting them by not letting them uh, drink the water from the, the well have joined their congregation when they when they uh, when they had it, they had a celebration service to to dedicate the well to the glory of God, and that's exactly what happened when those who who were excluding them came in, and together with one voice, it reminds me of Paul in Romans 15, they gave proper glory and honor to the to the God who provided uh, this this uh, life giving blessing to them. It was <clears throat> it was a way that they were able to reflect the character of the God who provides life-giving blessing even to God, even while we were enemies and even to his own enemies as a way of, of, of uh, engaging in practices that, uh, that were peacemaking practices in ways that reflected the character of the God of peace, to use Paul's language, to those around them. In that very action, That was a display of the very holiness of God to those around them, the very character and activity of God to those around them. And so it it actually transformed those around them. But, But it did more because even in that setting, when it's common sense to retaliate, and it is in our social setting as well, the commonsensical way to deal with people is to retaliate when people treat you wrongly. But in that kind of a, a local setting, um, even as they're engaged in this practice, as the imaginations of people within that body were being uh, reshaped in ways that helped them to unlearn those kinds of patterns of acting. And in the process, as they were engaged in participation in God's mission, God was shaping them more into the image of the cruciform son. Um, who is the very image of God. And so participation in the mission of God and being conformed to the image of God go hand in hand. In the Church of North America, clearly we, we don't, most of us, I suppose the people in Flint, Michigan may have, a, may have something to say about it, but, but at this point, I mean, most of us don't struggle uh, to, uh, to have clean, life-giving water. Um, but certainly there are places, so many places in our culture in which um, we might begin to participate in um, reflecting the character of God by participating in the, the mission of God. Um, and there, there's the, the examples would be obviously way too many to name. Um, in the book I have, a, um, I have some reflections. Um, in the last chapter on how churches might indeed begin to reflect the image of God and themselves be changed, themselves be in the process of being made holy, being sanctified, were they to uh, begin to engage the injustices, simple injustices around the corner from where they live. I have a, a, a discussion there about the payday loan industry. 
um, and some examples of where some churches have begun to educate themselves about this issue. It, it actually can be quite complex from a, a from the uh, a more uh, a larger economic standpoint. But yet, there are many people right around the corner. It's, it's what I call the injustice right around the corner. Whether you live in suburbia or you live in the uh, the inner city, more prevalent in lower socioeconomic uh, uh, places. But it is it, it is a uh, it is an industry that that can, can that can rob communities of shalom, individuals and communities of of shalom, the thriving that God intends for them to uh, be, uh, that, that God intends for their community and God intends for creation. When the church gets involved, and there might be a variety of ways, partnering with credit unions perhaps, um, or even simply addressing it with contributions and allowing people to even come in and tell their stories about the kind of utter entrapment in debt that, uh, that they've that's happened to them because they have uh, made use of one of these loans at one point and then they have to keep re-upping the loan because they can't pay it the often the 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 uh, often the uh, the interest rates on these things at least APR interest rates are over 400 um, percent the, the church needs to hear people's stories in this regard it may it, it sounds at times I've subsequently, Gotten to know a little more about the industry, and it, and and we we need to be careful how we address it. But, but I do think if the church is involved and begins to hear people's stories, and invite invite people in, and in, invite the people in the church themselves, because many of the people are our brothers and sisters in Christ who are being taken advantage of. If we can uh, begin to address these kinds of issues while we are addressing them, we ourselves might become changed just in the social interactions that we have as we participate in God's mission to, uh, to, to encourage shalom in, a, in communities. The kind of holiness that I grew up with was the sort of holiness that was an inward sort of thing. And what I'm hoping that the book does is to, to at least to, to explicate uh, what I see in Scripture as holiness as embodied, as corporate and personal. I don't think we can divorce those, um, but, uh, but, but we need to recover that corporate dimension of acting as a, how do we act as a body in, the, in, the, in our society that would actually begin to persuade people that, that the Holy God is in fact among us.